think we're going to begin recording. So we'll go ahead and get started, everyone. Welcome uh, to another episode of Lunch with a Curator. My name is Jeff Sellers, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. This has been such a fun part of, uh, of our quarantine time that we've uh, been able to get these digital programs off, off and uh, learn just great little uh, pieces of Tennessee history. Today, we have one of those great pieces of Tennessee history uh, as we explore the iconic story of Old Glory and how that is a Tennessee connection. It's a Tennessee story, one of my favorite Tennessee stories. And we have uh, two guests with us today who are really, really going to, uh, to, to get us, uh, take us on a deep dive of that story. And there's no uh, two better people to, to, to share this story with us today. Um, before we get started, let's go over those all important housekeeping tips as we do every week. That first and most important one for us is the mute button. You should all be muted, but uh, if you aren't, just make sure that the red or the microphone down at the bottom left of your screen is red. It should be red, um, but uh, that way you can be sure that you are muted. Secondly is the chat feature. We want you to uh, communicate with us. We want you to think of questions to ask our guests today. So uh, the chat feature is located at the bottom of your screen. It's a little text bubble. All you have to do is run your cursor over it, click on it, and it'll come up down to the bottom right. And there you can ask questions to our panelists today. Just make sure when you do, you'll have a, um, a selection there. Just make sure it says all panelists and uh, enter your question and that can um, and we'll get that at the end of today's talk if you have any kind of troubleshooting problems we have with us on the line rachel helvering as well as mamie hassel and they can help you with any troubleshooting again just put that in the text box a chat box and send it away to them and they can help you out okay all right uh i think that takes care of all of our uh, housekeeping tips uh, we have many, many people joining us today. You may not be able to see everyone, but uh, they're on there. Uh, and uh, so when we get ready, you can, um, again, participate with the whole group here today. So without further ado, let's bring on our guests. And I'm going to introduce our curator of the day, Mr. Dan Pomeroy. If you know the Tennessee State Museum and if you know about the collection of the State Museum, his name is almost synonymous with the collection. He is our chief curator and director of collections, has been with the State Museum throughout most of his entire career and has uh, expanded. He and along with his, uh, his staff and team of collections um, professionals have built and um, built this collection into something that is worthy of the great state of Tennessee's history. Uh, Dan has studied and researched the topic of old glory and its story to Tennessee. And so with that, Dan, welcome to Lunch with a Curator. It's so great to have you as the chief curator here on the, uh, on the program with us. Are you ready to take it away? Ready. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, pleasure to be here. Of course, we're doing this uh, in conjunction with a flag day, which is Sunday. And we thought it would be appropriate to pay homage to Jim Driver and Old Glory. And I did notice that the Tennessean is publishing a uh, print of the American flag in their edition uh, suitable for framing. So I invite everyone to do some research on Flag Day and the origins of Flag Day and why we have it, but it goes back to 1885, as I recall. Well, enough of that. We are going to talk about uh, William Driver, a, a man from New England who spent 20 years on the sea as a merchant seaman and captain who then came to Nashville and there were incidents in Nashville with his seagoing flag which he called Old Glory and that's how the American flag got to be called Old Glory. But I want to first uh, introduce Jack Benz, uh, William Driver's great great grandson uh, who we are fortunate enough to have join us today and I want to mention 
Jack knows exactly what he's talking about. He's got a, uh, a book that recently came out on his great great grandfather and old glory. And uh, it is well written, and well researched, and well illustrated. So if you want to learn more about William Driver, uh, be sure to look it up. Um, we might go ahead and start with our first slide. That is, that is a reproduction of Old Glory, and you'll see why it's a reproduction. We have in our collection, as it was re by his wife and his daughters. Uh, this is William Driver as a young man. He was born and raised in Salem, Massachusetts, and went to sea when he was 14 years old. And that is such an important part of his career and his story and is the origin of the flag of glory and he sailed uh, he was on the sea for 20 years and jack you know far more about his seafaring days than do i so why don't you tell us about his time on the sea well he i think we could probably refer to him as a prodigy because he was such an outstanding cabin boy his parents did not want him to go to sea, but uh, because his grandfather died at sea as a sea captain, but he was determined and he, uh, he, he left town, signed up as a cabin boy for $5 a month and went to sea on one of the swiftest ships in Salem at the time. He, uh, he made about five voyages uh, as a teenager to India, Europe, uh, and various places, South Pacific, and various other places, and uh, it was quite, uh, he was quite excited to be, to be on the sea, and wanted that to be his life work. And, uh, and uh, he got his first command at the age of 21 in 1824, and I believe that's when he uh, was presented the flag that he called Old Glory. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, he had, I have to proceed it a little bit by a voyage he made, I think his sixth voyage before, right before he became captain. He uh, went to Fiji. They had, uh, the, the, the folks, uh, the seagoing folks in uh, Salem had heard rumors about a, uh, a sea creature is a sea cucumber that was being harvested in the South Pacific, uh, Tahiti, Fiji, and those islands. And so they sent a ship there, which William went on. And uh, he, it turned out that when they got there, they were met by um, some uh, cannibals uh, who had destroyed another ship the year before and killed all of its uh, 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 sailors, but anyway, he um, uh, they became he became really very wealthy, beginning with that voyage by harvesting these things. They dry them out in the sun and sell them in China and Manila and the Philippines for uh, uh, sizable amounts of money. And uh, I'll tell you more about what happened on that trip near the end. But uh, then later, the next, uh, it, when he was 21 on his birthday, his mother and the ladies of Salem made a flag and wanted to surprise him. It was 12 by 24 feet. Now think about the size of that flag even today when it's not on a ship. But uh, they gave this to him and uh, he got, very excited about it, was not expecting it. And for some reason, he called it Old Glory. And I don't know why, and I'm not sure if anybody knows why he came up with that name. Rachel, can we, can we go to the next slide? Uh, 
that's an early view of Salem. And uh, in 1831, he was in command of a ship called the Charles Doggett. And the logbook from the Doggett is at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. We're going to take a take a look at that if we can get the next slide up. Uh, Jack, this is very a very very important part of William Driver's life. This voyage on the Doggett. Why don't you tell us about that? When he left Salem, uh, they were going to the the voyage was to uh, go to to New Zealand and uh, dry these sea cucumbers. But he left on uh, January the thirteenth, eighteen thirty one, uh, with six other ships. He was very suspicious of the weather. The weather had been the forecast had been good, but he was looking at the at the sky and he suspected a storm a snowstorm of all things thinking about january in new england and they uh, they left and they, they encountered this storm as well they did the other ships six the six other ships sank and all crew were lost uh before they got far uh out of salem and um, uh, the archives has the record of this in his own hand about the storm and how they went through the storm and uh, finally got into the Gulf Stream where there was warm uh, water and uh, had a pleasant sail then all the way to uh, uh, New Zealand. Yeah. Uh and rescued the survivors of the bounty. Uh, the children of the survivors of the uh, bounty and took them back to Pitcairn Island. And that was so important to him, such a signature episode in his life, that if you go to the Nashville Cemetery now, you can find his memorial that he designed himself and it emphasizes that he saved these folks and took them back to Pitcairn Island. One thing that uh, occurred uh, just before he got to Tahiti was uh, he was boarded by Titora, who was a, uh, one of the terrorists actually in New Zealand. And uh, they boarded 100 uh, savages, boarded his ship and um, Charlie, he had a dog named Charlie, and uh, uh, the dog got after these guys, chased them off, and they were safe from there, and then went on to Tahiti. And the, the queen, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, survivors of the mutiny on the bounty had been to Pitcairn Islands, and they ended up back in Tahiti. Uh, and uh, these were the family survivors. Most of them had died except for one, and um, they were they were dying all over the place there in Tahiti. And begged, she begged driver to take them back, which was a fourteen hundred mile trip in twenty one days. He prayed for perfect weather and got it. And uh, so they went there. There's a lot of history about Pitcairn that. Uh, it's really interesting that if anybody's interested in checking out Pitcairn Islands, it's uh, it's only a two mile long island, and how they survived there with uh, that many that many descendants of the mutineers uh, with very little to go on is amazing to me. It is. It is. Let's go on for next slide. And uh, in 1837. Uh, Captain Driver came back to Salem to discover that his wife was very, very ill. And uh, how many children did they have, Jack? Children at that time. And um, uh, he got back and realized she had throat cancer and died. And uh, uh, he realized, of course, that he could not go to sea anymore and was going to have to move uh, somewhere away from Salem, and that's what he did. So he had uh, a shoe retail business in Nashville, 
1837, the last year of Andrew Jackson's presidency, and so he moved to Nashville. Uh, this is a photograph of the town square in Nashville uh, that's in the State Museum collection. <clears throat> we have dated this as 1853. We believe it to be the earliest photograph of, uh, of Nashville. So he would have been very familiar with this street scene. So he moved to Nashville and it ended up uh, uh, remarrying in 1838 and having additional children and was married at Christ uh, Church, which is now located on Broadway. And they had a house that is on present day Fifth Avenue South. Um, and he brought his flag oh, that he had called Old Glory in 1831 with him to Nashville. And he hung this flag out on election days and holidays such as the 4th of July. Uh, uh, and so it could be an important part of the landscape of Nashville. Let's take a look at the next slide. This is a wonderful photograph of the driver home taken in 1861. And this is from the driver photo album that's at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. And you can see that they have dr drawn the rope that would hang from the window of the house and they would tie it to a locust tree. And then Old Glory would hang down from that rope and it got to be quite a celebratory icon for Nashville uh, from uh, for about 20 years. Well, as the Civil War came along and sectional tensions increased, and then Tennessee in June 1861 voted to leave the Union and join the Confederacy. That flag got to be a symbol of the enemy instead of a symbol of unity and nationalism. For most Nashvillians, it got to be a symbol of the en enemy, which we should all be aware that we all have differing views of what the uh, United States flag represents. And here in this case, the flag went from being a symbol of an adored symbol of the nation to a flag of disunity. And William Driver was so worried about it, he wanted to protect it. The first thing he did, it was so threadbare, he had his wife and daughters re sew it. And uh, they radically diminished the size. Uh, they added stars. The original flag had 24 stars. Uh, the re-sewn flag, they had they added 30, uh, 34 stars. They had 34 stars. And they also added an anchor at the bottom right of the canton, represent, <coughs> representing William Driver's uh, uh, service in the as a merchant seaman. So uh, this was an, an uh, this was a turbulent time, and he was very concerned about the flag, so he took it to a neighbor's house and had them sew it into a quilt so that it it couldn't be found and couldn't be destroyed. And he was confronted with people, Jack, why don't you tell us? You said even the governor before him. Well, he had a group of uh, Confederate soldiers that came. I think they were sent by the governor or the mayor of Nashville, and uh, they came to his door and uh, wanted, the, they demanded the flag. And uh, it was a big bone of contention at that time, and he wouldn't give it to him. he refused. Uh, they came in anyway, searched the house, he had it stored in the comforter, of course, it was sewn there, and then he had it uh, folded up and, and uh, uh, stored in his old sea chest which he brought with him when he retired from the sea. And then later, the governor, Isham Harris, came to his door, and um, he, he also, uh, they were friends, but actually after this visit, not anymore. And uh, the governor demanded the flag, and he said, over my dead body, and uh, the governor left. They never did get the flag. It, it uh, stayed in that sea box until he uh, gave it to his daughter. Let's go on the next. 
This is a militia group believed to be in Nashville, and it would be about 1861. And this is when uh, military organizations were forming all over the state. And the important thing to remember here is that William Driver remained loyal and steadfast and adamant in his allegiance to the United States and to the Union, but he was he was virtually alone among his uh, Nashville wife and children, and he wrote a letter to his daughter Martha, who had moved to Salem or was now living in Salem, and he and he mentioned that he was alone and that he had sons now serving in the Confederate Army. So this would have been a terrible, uncomfortable time for him. And remember, he was hiding that flag, perhaps from his own family. Go to the next slide. This is sheet music for the Rock City Guards. Of course, Nashville was known as Rock City. And anybody who knows all about the limestone around here knows why. So the Rock City Guards was one of those militia groups that was formed uh, with the uh, coming uh, of the conflict, the American Civil War. And his son, George Driver, joined the Rock City Guards. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, a first national design Confederate flag that was presented to Company B of the Rock City Guards, sewn by the girls of Nashville and presented to them. Uh, we believe that star in the corner was meant to be joined by stars in each corner. Uh, this flag is part of the collection of the State Museum. We have about 70 original Civil War flags in our collection. So this flag was presented to Company B in the Rock City Guards just before they boarded a train and headed off to Virginia, where they fought at the Battle of Cheap Mountain, and this flag was captured during that encounter. So here's William Driver in Nashville, this uh, loyal with his loyalty to the Union and his son, his sons and his family supporting the Confederacy. Uh, he also worked as a volunteer in the hospital. Uh, he was indefatigable. Go to the next slide. Well, this is an illustration of the Battle of Fort Donelson in February 1862. Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland River both fell to a hitherto unknown general named Ulysses S. Grant. And once Fort Donelson fell, it opened the Cumberland River and as a pathway, as a highway for Union gunboats to come to the Tennessee State Capitol. So effectively, Nashville was the first Confederate capital city to fall to Union arms. Go to the next slide. This is a, uh, a print showing a Union encampment. You can see the State Capitol on the hillside in the background. And I'm showing this because Nashville became a central uh, a supply point and troop point for the Union campaign all in the Western Theater. And the Western Theater being down into Georgia and Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, really the Trans-Mississippi across the river. So Tennessee got to be a hub of Union activity. That's uh, next slide, please. Well, the first unit to arrive in Nashville on the 25th of February, 1862, was the 6th Ohio. And this sketch is at the Tennessee State Library and Archives showing the 6th Ohio before the state capitol on that day, the 25th of February, 1862. And it's important because what happened was they arrived in Nashville and William Driver brought his flag out of hiding. Jack, why don't you tell us about that? Well, he met, uh, he, he went down to the uh, to First Avenue, uh, those of you from Nashville familiar with that area, and 
and met the boats when they came in, the gunboats from the uh, from the north, uh, directed by General Bull Nelson. And he told him that he was a former sea captain, and uh, it so happens General Nelson was also a former sea captain. So they hit it off pretty good, and he said, I've got a flag, Old Glory, that I call Old Glory, and I'd like to put it at the top of the Capitol and that Confederate flag down. And so General Nelson uh, agreed. He sent a, a group of soldiers down to his house to get the flag and march back up to the Capitol building. Driver himself climbed up to the uh, fl uh, flagpole flew his flag and stayed with it all night until a storm came up and he had to take it down, replace it with another flag. So that's an interesting story about how he was great, how General Nelson was greeted in Nashville. It was, uh, it was Captain Driver that met him and, and, and talked with him about the flying of the flag. You know, we're all, we're all familiar with Barbara Fritchie uh, about an elderly woman in Frederick, Maryland, showing the flag and her allegiance to the flag as Confederate soldiers under Stonewall Jackson go through Frederick, Maryland, and she became a, a, a national folk hero. Uh, that's, there's uh, a, a lot of controversy about how much truth there is to that story, but this story is true. So you have this elderly sea captain meeting the Union troops, bringing his flag out from hiding in that coverlet, and then himself putting it up on the Tennessee Capitol. And this story spread throughout the nation, and he became quite a hero. Uh, and really, that is how the flag got to be known as Old Glory. So when anybody refers to the American flag as Old Glory, this is the origin of that story. We, we have, we acquired a few years ago, a letter from a soldier in the 6th Ohio, written back to his brother on the 28th of February. And let me quote from that letter. One old sea captain living in Nashville had the stars and stripes hid in a coverlet. And on our arrival, he brought it out and gave it to us and on the state house, it floats now. Well, it didn't actually continue to float until the 28th, but uh, so he would have been a member of that 6th Ohio formed up there before the Capitol when William Driver unfurled his flag. So that is the point in time that the American flag really started taking on the name Old Glory. Go to the next slide. This is a photograph of the Capitol taken in 1864 during the war. You can see the military tents on the ground. And uh, the, the, the major flagpole was there on the west entrance where the, uh, the columns. Uh, and during the war, William Driver was appointed to a number of boards, including the, he was an alderman for Nashville. Uh, he served on the board of claims. So if you had damage to your property during the war and you would want re, uh, reimbursement by the federal government, he was on the board of claims. And I think there were only three members on that board. So he filled a number of responsible positions during the war. And of course, the military governor was Andrew Johnson and he would have been in that capital. That, that grounds around there was known as Fort Johnson. And he and William Driver knew each other well. Great, great grandfather was quite a man, Jack. Yes, he was. Well, his son, George, continued to serve in the Confederate Army. Let's go to the next slide. And he fought for the Confederacy in October 1862 at the Battle of Perryville, Kentucky. This is an illustration of part of that. And he was mortally wounded in that battle and it ended up dying uh, shortly thereafter as a result of his wounds. And next slide, please. 
This is George Driver's Bible, one of the most cherished artifacts at the State Museum that he had with him uh, during his time as a soldier. And you will see there that it is written that he had this Bible with him and it cites the last Bible verse that was read to him before he died. So, so William Driver, the stalwart uh, ally and allegiance uh, to the Union as a son now dying in the military service for the Confederate States of America. Quite a poignant story. Next slide, please. This is a drawing of the fortifications at Fort Negley. And if you get the opportun opportunity to go to Fort Negley uh, City Park, please do so. Uh, in December 1864, the Confederate Army approached South Nashville. And Fort Negley was a primary, the primary a fortification defending the Union. And William Driver, at his age, remember this man was born in 1803, goes and volunteers to serve the artillery to repel the Confederates, to serve the artillery at Fort Negley. And what did he do with uh, Old Glory at that time, Jack? Well, William is about in his uh, early to mid 60s at this time during the war. And he uh, he was asked to assist with the defense of, of Nashville. And um, he went up with up to Fort Nagley to join the Confederate Army and man the cannon. He hung the flag up on the side of his house and uh, he uh, he said, if this flag comes down, I'm going to destroy the house and everything with it. So he, as you say, he is a he was a very strong willed man. I wouldn't want to go up against him in in a court case. <laughs> no, he leaves that flag outside of his house and warns his family that it better stay there or he himself will have the house fired on. Uh, an incredible story. Uh, next slide, please. This is a photograph of William Driver at about this time. And you'll notice not that's not his handwriting. Someone has written down there, Old Glory, and he is identified on the reverse. But this would this would have been William Driver at about this time. Uh, 1864 to 1870, uh, also in the collection of the State Museum. Next slide, please. This is William Driver's journal, and he writes about these incidents. This journal is at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Obviously, a wealth of information. Uh, this was donated by uh, uh, Jane Driver, Jane Driver Rowland's husband. I'll, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Next slide, please. This is Jane Driver Rowland, the daughter of William Driver, and her husband, uh, Charles Rowland. He was a union officer whom she married. Uh, she met him in Nashville. And this photograph was taken in Wales, Nevada. And that is old glory that they hung up on the side of the house uh, to have their picture, to have their photograph taken. Uh, Jack, why don't you tell us how Jane Driver came into possession of old glory? Well, he gave um, uh, Driver in that photograph of him. He was very lonely at that time. His family had deserted him because he. Held, he held strong with the Union, but he gave uh, the original Old Glory flag to Mary Jane Rowland, who you see in this picture. He also gave another flag uh, later on to a niece. And there was a big argument about, about the flags that, came, that arose later. Uh, 
the niece had given her flag to the Essex Institute. And there you see the flag. And Mary Jane had given her flag, the original flag, to the Smithsonian. So the two family members uh, got in a big fuss about which one was the correct flag, which one was the original Old Glory. And uh, after a lot of discussion, a lot of politics, uh, Mary Jane finally won out in Essex uh, uh, admitted that they did not have the flag. It was a lot of lot of uh, giving and taking about that time with both of these organizations. So the so the flag, the the the, the old glory flag, the true old glory flag is currently in the Smithsonian. But uh, I think Dan, you remember it was here in your museum, in the State Museum uh what eight or eight or ten years ago and then yeah. later was retired for good it's not on display it used to be on display the smithsonian but not anymore yes uh, 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 uh jane had visited her father in 1873 and that turned out to be the last time she saw him and she had boarded the train to head back west and all of a sudden her father appears with a wrapped up package unanticipated 1873 he hands the package to her and he says this is my ship flag old glory i love it as a mother loves a child take it and cherish it as i have always cherished it and so she had custody of old glory since then and and you're right then uh the niece presents this flag to the peabody essex uh, museum after william driver's death and it got to be quite a dust up about which flag was the original old glory go to the next slide uh these are in the state museum collections identified as pieces of old glory and we know that this was not part of the original flag the material the warp and weft are different than the original flag but what happened is that uh william driver referred to, he owned several flags and he referred to them all as uh, old glory as his daughter wrote in 1908, Pa had many flags and he called them all old glory, just as they are called today. So he would give pieces of flags to people in good faith and say, this is a piece of old glory because he called all of his flags old glory. I suspect that's what happened with his niece. He asked her, he gave her a flag and he called it old glory too. Uh, so there was there was confusion, but let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit more about Mary. Mary Jane, here she is standing before uh, Old Glory inside of her house in 1920, and this is when she's really wa uh, waging a campaign to have the flop position identified as the. And she hits upon the idea of giving it to the United States government, and she sends it to President Warren G. Harding. And uh, so the federal government sends, uh, the president sends it to the Smithsonian. They investigate it. They investigate the Essex flag. They finally determine that Mary Jane's flag is the legitimate and real old glory. And next slide, please. This is a letter from uh, President Harding to Mary Jane uh, acknowledging receipt of the flag and that this is the original Old Glory. So she was vindicated. This letter is 1922. So she was vindicated. Now, upon her death a few years later, her uh, widower, Charles Rowland, uh, ended up offering the documentation the ship's log and so forth to the tennessee state li librarian and that's why we have this wealth of wonderful material at the state library and archive 
where you'll find this letter as well. Next slide, please. So this is a plate from the Spanish-American War in 1898, and by now, the United States flag is commonly referred to as Old Glory, as it is on this plate. Uh, next slide. Here we have posters from World War I. And what's the soldier going off to do? He's going off to fight for Old Glory. And the museums are raising Old Glory. So it was common usage, uh, certainly uh, in the early 20th century. Next slide, please. Here's a book from 1920s, uh, also in the collection of the State Museum. Next slide. And here's a postcard from World War II. It's all about old glory. So it's, uh, uh, next slide. In 1959, we had two new states admitted to the Union, Hawaii and Alaska. So this was put out as a commemorative of that incident. We now have uh, 50 stars on the flag, and the flag here is referred to as Old Glory. Next slide. This is the flag that is at the Smithsonian Institution, and you can see how threadbare it is. If you look carefully, you can see that this is the flag that was re sewn in 1861, and you can see the anchor in the blue canton in the bottom right corner put there to honor William Driver and his career. Uh, the flag is so fragile. Uh, you're right, Jack, we had it a, a little more than 10 years ago, and it was quite an enterprise to bring it down here and put it out for exhibit. It is so fragile. It has had two major conservation efforts. And I'm not sure when it can ever be put out on exhibit again, but uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful tribute to William Driver, to Tennessee history, the flag at the Smithsonian Institution, and so much more documentation here at the State Museum and the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Uh, so Jack, any final words? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I, 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 as I mentioned, uh, I've done research on the flag and William Driver for over 50 years. In 1968, this is an interesting point. Louise Davis used to write a lot of articles about the flag and William Driver, and I got to know her, and she helped me with some of this research, and as I helped her. But she called one day and talked with my mother, and she said, I have a man in my office at the newspaper named Rodney Ackerman. He's from Fiji, and he claims to be a great-great-grandson of William Driver. Well, on that first trip to Fiji, not as a captain, but as a crew at about 18, age 18, he... Uh, mistakenly married the the chief of Fiji's daughter in a marriage that he was not really aware that he had married her under the island rules. And so they ended up with a son named Isaac. And uh, this man that came to Nashville was a great, great grandson, as I am. And uh, so we, my mother didn't believe it, I did. And uh, it turns out that we have probably thousands of relatives, descendants from Isaac, all over Australia and the South Pacific. I'd love to meet some of them. <laughs> That's quite a story, though. That, that really is. And thank you for bringing that up. I haven't about that. Well, that, that include, concludes our story on William Driver and Old Glory. Jeff, do we have any questions? Uh, we certainly do, Dan. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Jack and Dan. That was a phenomenal uh, talk. And man, it's such a, uh, a a big story. And and I mean, just so many different ways it comes through um, 
uh, from Fiji all the way here to Nashville to Washington and beyond. Uh, here's one, Dan. Uh, the sixth Ohio letter is great. Um, uh, no, let's see this one. Uh, is there oh, the Rock City Guards uh, intended to support the Union uh, or Confederacy? Um, they they noticed a, a U.S. flag on the Rock City Guard sheet music. Uh, that's because they were formed before secession and the war. They were formed and authorized by the state. I believe in 1859. So, so that sheet music predates secession. Okay, okay. Um, what role does the flag play in, uh, in, in ship or maritime situations? And, uh, and, and why was it so, uh, why was the flag so important to William Driver? Well, Jack, you might be better prepared to answer that. Well, I really don't have any information. I know he was a great patriot and uh, was certainly faithful to the Union, as we see throughout his lifetime. Where the name came from, we don't know. And um, uh, why he was so dedicated to the flag uh, is something we don't know either. But the fact, the, tr the fact remains he was and uh, uh, was uh, as dedicated to the flag and to the union, to the country and what it stands for, probably as much or more than any person I've ever read about. How did it really, how did it go, uh, how did it go from being, you know, locally known, uh, known in the, among the Civil War soldiers, uh, to becoming this this almost brand name of the flag in World War One and World War Two, was it something that was um, spread through the newspapers, or you know, how did it catch fire and really become synonymous with all uh, the flag? Stories in those days, as you know, Jeff, would have been printed in newspapers. It was in the Seattle of Massachusetts paper, and other newspapers picked up their stories from other newspapers. And this thing just caught fire and just was all over the country, uh, just like Barbara Fritchie. So all of a sudden, hear the story of this uh, old sea captain loyal to the Union and the first capital city of the Confederacy to fall to the Union. That was quite an event in and of itself. So it all balled up into just being this uh, wildfire of news sweeping the sweeping the country, uh, particularly the northern states, and became quite famous. All right, well, uh, I think that's about all of the questions we have or the time for the questions we have today. Uh, I do want to thank uh, you, Dan and, uh, and Jack. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, that's a phenomenal story and such a great iconic Tennessee story. So thank you both so much for being with us. And uh, I also want to say thank you for joining us to all the attendees. We've had so many people online today. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you a heads up on next week. Please uh, join us again. We have our curator of archaeology and our curator of art and architecture. Debbie Shaw and Jim Hubler, and they're going to explore our First Peoples collection by looking at the artistry of the Mississippian Indians in Tennessee. So that's going to be a really cool, uh, cool program to tune into. That's again here at noon on Wednesday. If you want to go back and watch this episode or any of the prior episodes we've had, uh, check out our YouTube channel. Just type in Tennessee State Museum, subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, you'll get all of our uh, digital program offerings that we're offering throughout the week. So uh, lots going on at the museum. Stay tuned at our website, tnmuseum.org, and our social media for all kinds of updates and news. All right, guys, thanks again for joining us. We'll say goodbye here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. Goodbye.